Evening, Frank. Good evening, Jerry. <laughs> Frank. Yeah. Evening, boys. Evening, boys. to this. Yeah. Can I do? Can I? I can't believe that. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it here. I just want to say hello to uh, these wonderful people, if you don't mind, boys. Uh, you know, because they are listening in. They're listening in to everything here. Anyway, um, Daryl Mary, uh, like, share, good people, get them algorithms, guys. <laughs> the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> Lost the page. <coughs> I, 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 I've lost that page. Oh, there it is. Um, Vows of Flowers, it's Lee Carlson. Evening, folks. Evening. And, uh, there's lots, you know, there's, I, I'm, I'm awfully sorry about this. Steve LFC. Hiya, Frank. Hiya, Steve LFC. Hope everyone's there. Uh, Good. I hope everybody's good. And uh, listen. Oh yeah, look. Uh, evening, Anthony, uh, mate. Evening, Derek, mate. And that's from Daryl Mary. Hi, Daryl. Thank you. Is that? <coughs> well, listen, boys. Accept my apologies, please, uh, for being uh, a bit late. Oh, there's a good, very good friend of mine. Why not the bus stop there, Fred? Is it chucking it down? Yeah. How about this one? I bet you she was uh, I bet she was suffering from an angover. Teresa Maria Fitzgerald. Evening Frank and guests. <laughs> Teresa Maria Fitzgerald. Couldn't get any Irish than that, could you? Good evening, though. And Gary Rigby, evening Frank and everyone. Thank you, Gary. Evening, Gary. Gary. Hey Gary, uh, let me know if you went on. Uh, I think it was a stream that uh, I did a, a video or something. I think it was um, Scouts Not English. Did you comment on that or something like that? You know, when you mentioned me, let me know. If you're, uh... Oh, look, yeah, there's Gap. Look, there's Gap. Hi, Frank and lads, looking forward to a great show. Got <laughs> painting. <laughs> I'd love to be great because they sponsor us. <laughs> I hope so, anyway. And there's uh, the wonderful, there's the wonderful Derek um, Shelmadine's book. If you haven't got this, it's unbelievable. Uh, do you know what, Derek? I, 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 I'm looking at my library there, and I, it's chocolate. There you are, look. Yeah. And it's chock a block. I, I keep forgetting to get it out to uh, it. Is to shock people. There's always any one our, to hand, Frank. Any of our guys on Facebook, you Facebook, Derek and Rock and Roll is on Facebook. So tune in, check it out there, and follow. Yeah. Thanks, Just nice. get, honestly, mm. boys and girls, get a uh, get this you know, rock and roll unraveled. It's mm. if you're into music. It's that thick. It's like an, well, it is an encyclopedia. It really is. It's unbelievable. It's an un unbelievable thing. Do you never have Sorry? Do you never had encyclopedias like that when I was a kid? Not much. Yeah. But I'd, yeah. I'd love them to, to have, you know, you tune into various. I mean, we, we had music around us. Growing up in the 60s, 70s, 80s and stuff was fantastic. But it didn't really get the attention academically that it deserved, I don't think, no. at the time. And so we were we were finding bits of information out um, from the back of album covers. Absolutely. So someone would make a mention of someone else and you know, and then that's kind of what brought me to the subject I know Derek is gonna talk about tonight, is yeah. is little snippets of information over many years on album covers and and in in the occasional interview you know yeah. which, which now thankfully we've got the beauty of uh of, of this like tonight's show yeah, social media social yeah, media yeah. we've got youtube and we've got all, all of that kind of stuff which is brilliant i i, I would like to uh 
express my sympathies at the the loss of Steve Harley, who, oh. who died the past uh, was it yesterday, the day before? Yeah. The day before, yeah. Man, he, he he would have been a big part of our lives and he growing up through the seventies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, he was a big part of our lives. He was, he really was. Well, I, I think any, t no matter what generation we're from, music plays a hell of a uh, part of our yeah. lives for memories. Absolutely, yeah. Memories. Yeah. I, I, I listen to music and it reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, memories going back, but uh, I was not that. Yeah. I, I was listening to so I was looking at a photo. Uh, Jason had it blown up for me, and it was lads. Uh, it was taken of me and my mates at New Ferry Bats, and uh, you know uh, it was really emotional stuff. Simply because most of the lads have gone, and they were my mates. <coughs> and that got. Uh, and at the same time, he had some music uh, uh, playing away, and it was the 60s stuff, and uh, it was the Four Tops playing, and oh. that reminded me of, you know, when we were going out on Saturday nights. Yeah. You know, I'll be there, you know, that one, absolutely. Mm. Anyway. That's the case. Uh, we talk a lot in, about history and and um, immortality. I think mm -hmm. your um, if you write a piece of music, which which extends generations, then that in its way is immortality. Yes. When people get that music, uh, whether yes. it's or the Beatles or, or or whoever we choose in the middle of it, it's such a powerful emotion and such a powerful thing in our lives you know yeah. we grow up with it constantly yeah yeah and this is why it's great having Derek on because you know we're going to be talking now what are you going to talk about first and foremost this is just in case uh, some people missed it uh, the last time you were on Derek what mm -hmm. are we talking about tonight well we're taking a look at um, uh, John Hammond um, a name that doesn't necessarily spring to mind. I mean, if you're into jazz, I mean, John Hammond uh, has been called uh, the most important non-musician um, in jazz um, ever. But I, th I think almost to put him into context, we need to start at the end of the story, 1986, a year or so before he died, or less than a year before he died. Um, and he was inducted into the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, that was the inaugural um, uh, Hall of Fame inductions. So, you know, people like um, Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, um, you know, that was when um, they were all being uh, inaugurated as uh, performers. And uh, he, so at that particular time, uh, you know, the Hall of Fame for their Lifetime Achievement Award had the choice of just about, well, they had the choice of everybody uh, who was still alive, uh, who contributed to the music business. And John Hammond was the first one to receive the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. So that sort of puts him into some serious context. And what's even more fascinating is that um, when you sort of delve down into John Hammond's story, yeah, he's famous, very, very famous, particularly for uh, discovering uh, Bob Dylan, um, Aretha Franklin as well, he played a big part in, and Bruce Springsteen. Uh, he was the one that uh, discovered um, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, but in the jazz front, um, from the ooh, early 30s, he was very, very uh, active. And right through then, he... he um, Charlie Christian? Wasn't it? Well, what about, well, you know, you just mentioned there uh, Bob Dylan and, you know, the, this kind of uh, genre of singers. John Hammond, do you know what I always thought he was? He had something to do with uh, television, you know, uh, producing. Like, uh, or am I getting mixed up with the Hammonds, uh, another Hammonds, you know, uh, who, who produced television shows? 
Musical uh, television. He probably, he probably would have produced some television shows. I mean, the guy was, um, you know, his interests were far and wide. He was a talent scout, uh, almost above all. I mean, he was a producer. Right. He produced quite a lot of stuff. Um, right. but he was also a promoter. Um, you know, he and I mean, that was the reason why um, in the very early days, um, you know, he started out in jazz. I mean, basically, um, he went to live in Greenwich Village when he was uh, 21 years old. And then he got him very involved in the uh, jazz scene and he was a jazz DJ. And uh, in the like very early 30s, like 33 kind of time, um, you know, he's, he's discovering people like Count Basie and uh, Benny Goodman. And he's very responsible for uh, actually bringing their um, careers um, off the ground, as it were. I mean, he heard Count Basie on the TV. He thought, oh, this guy's pretty damn good. Um, and then he, you know, he he put him in, but basically he, he helped him achieve, um, you know, national, international um, fame. I, I love the story about, um, it, again, uh, sadly not as well known as he should have been, Charlie Christian. The Absolutely. Who, who came from a very um, impoverished background and sadly his talent was meteoric but he only had a short window of opportunity yeah. to play and um, I believe it was John Hammond who um, got him the gig and from that we all get to know him and obviously Charlie Christian was the first electrified guitar player on the planet, you know, that, that brought jazz music, uh, guitar music right to the front. So from there after, you, you can draw the line between him and T-Bone Walker, B.B. King, and then we're into, you know, the people we, we, we grew up with, Zeppelin and the like. You know, all from John Hammond to me was is is kind of a hero. He's heroic. He's the the Jürgen Klopp of the music industry in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, right the way till he died, wasn't he? Oh, when absolutely, he absolutely. And it, it's, 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 was Stevie Ray Vaughan? Absolutely. Yeah, another one of his discoveries. Well, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. You might just say. <laughs> oh no! I mean, the, the story oh, of uh, oh, you're in the pub. <laughs> it, it will, it, it's a weird. It's a weird one. Like Derek said before, we we know little of the name. Someone mentions the name, you think who? But then when you mention his accomplishments and who he, he signed and who he put himself on the line to sign, when other people were saying. Oh, don't, absolutely. Don't waste your time with that, you know? Absolutely. He I think the Charlie Christian ones, sorry. He's meteoric, me. Yeah. I think the Charlie Christian story is really interesting. Um, I mean, basically, we're talking uh, sort of 1937 when he started um, the electric guitar. Uh, it, basically, it was acoustic guitar with a pickup. They were just a little bit ahead of the um, solid bass guitar from the likes of uh, Led Paul, the log, and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. But the, the way that um, uh, John Hammond actually uh, helped uh, Charlie Christensen, I mean, he, he discovered him, thought, wow, this guy is good. He should, he, and he was already been involved with Benny Goodman for a long time. So he int introduced him to uh, Benny Goodman and um, uh, Charlie Christian auditioned in uh, 1939. Now, <laughs> Benny Goodman, you've got to bear in mind, electric guitars in the late 30s were pretty few and far between. Uh, so when he auditioned, Benny Goodman was not particularly um, interested. Um, and he, But John Hammond wasn't having any of this. So uh, later on, when the, um, the band were actually gigging, uh, Hammond manoeuvred uh, Christensen. Uh, Charlie Christian um, onto the stage basically now this time Goodman wasn't very happy he'd been outmaneuvered as it were so he launched into a song called or a tune called Rose Room which is uh, you know quite a, a complicated jazz piece thinking that this young upstart Charlie Christian guitar chappy uh, won't be able to keep up quite the opposite um, apparently he played an absolute stormer and uh, Goodman hired him uh, on the spot. 
So I, th I think that's one of the great stories about how passionate um, uh, John Hammond was about his, uh, his artists. And the other thing about him that isn't widely known, I don't think, he was a big civil rights um, yeah. uh, activist. He was, a, he was actually a director of the uh, NA, uh, AA, NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, which started off in 1909. Um, and it's still going uh, to this day. And that, that was one of the really big forces in the 50s and 60s um, civil rights struggle. Yeah, I mean, that's a um, more amazing kind of when you look back in, in terms of, of history, and what was going on in history, because John Harmon came from a, a, a fairly affluent background. <clears throat> yeah. So he, he didn't have to, to kind of... Um, this was not a nine to five job for him, was it? It was a, for him, even though he wasn't a musician, he was passionate about supporting people who he felt needed to be put in front of an audience, which which is is obviously uh, everyone would love that 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 kind of uh, push, and um, yeah, I remember. Um, because it took me years and years to, 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 to get to know about him. And again, you, when you look at the back of album covers and you see who produced it and where he came from, mm -hmm. I mean, my, my first um, understanding of him was with Robert Johnson. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful story which said that um, John Hammond had heard Robert Johnson or heard of him and said, I want to put this guy in front of an audience. So he went looking for him. And sadly, um, he, he organized a show, which I think was Spirituals to Gospels, something That's right. like that, where he was trying to amalgamate this wonderful force of music to show us all what it was about. Um, and Sadly, Robert Johnson had died a week before <clears throat> he, got, he got hold of him. And yeah. Big Bill Brunsey, I think, was got his job. But that, to me, stuck with me when I was young. And then over the years, you know, you find out he's done that, he's done that, he's done. Yeah. Remarkable, remarkable work. Yeah, that spirituals to swing. There was the first concert was in 1938 in the December, and there was another one uh, a year later. And I have actually seen a poster with Robert Johnson um, actually build on that because, as you say, he died uh, around that sort of time, so he was probably aimed to be on it. I mean, there's a great story about uh, Big Bill Brunsey. Uh, apparently, he took the bus from his home in Arkansas to New York, it was on a Carnegie Hall. So, so he had a bus ride from Arkansas to, uh, to go to the gig. <laughs> I don't know if his roadie went with him. <laughs> well, he, he, didn't, he didn't know about the encore thing, did he? <laughs> he, he and, and when the, the kind of the acts came on and you do your stuff, and it's like at the end of the night, we all come on, you know, and you, we all yeah. take a bow. He, he got off on the bus. He got the bus back to, to Arkansas or wherever. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, but I mean, Bessie Smith was one of the really early influences as well. Uh, wow. he, probably about 1927, he heard Bessie Smith on the radio and was really, really impressed. And it, it is, uh, uh, he went to see her. And, you know, the, the quote you often see is he was enormously moved by Bessie Smith's performance at the Alhambra Theatre um, when he went to see her. And that's often thought to be the sort of catalyst that um, inspired him into music and particularly into supporting uh, black African-American, uh, Afro-Caribbean um, yeah. singers. He saw, yeah. he saw the difference in um, the, the, the promotion, if you like, for, mm. for white acts and country acts and whatever's going on. And, um, and the coloreds weren't given that opportunity. But Frank, it's it's like you might not know the 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 people, um, Bessie Smith and the likes, but the the songs that came to us, man. I mean, Bessie Smith sings one of our soundtrack songs. When the two of us are in town, and we're not raging against the world, 
but it's one of those you look at the bottom of the glass and what comes to my mind is the song nobody loves you when you're down when you're and down out. out yeah exactly which is which is i mean it's been covered so many times oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting, he, he got involved with Bessie Smith and he actually um, set up and I think produced her last ever uh, recording. But he, one of the other people he discovered was uh, the, the great Billie Holiday. Um, and he arranged for her to, um, he hooked her up basically with Benny, Benny Goodman. And they recorded uh, what was her first ever single, uh, Your Mother's Son-in-Law. Now, I don't know what kind of song that is, I mean, but it's a fabulous uh, title. And it's great. The credit on the, on the record is uh, Benny Goodman and his orchestra with vocal refrain by Billie Holiday. And I thought that was really rather nice. Uh -huh. And he was with Billie Holiday. That was uh, 33. And he was involved with Billie Holiday till about 37. And he, you know he really rates uh, Billie Holiday as one of the, the great singers. Well, well, you you've got to think that without him, then we wouldn't know the name Billie Holiday, would we? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think Billy, Billy Holiday's father, I think, was uh, with Benny Goodman as well. It was quite a close knit um, community. Wow. I'm all for the kind of uh, Brian Epstein thing, you know, again, we moved the clock forward and would we have heard of the Beatles if it wasn't for Brian Epstein? And there's an argument on both sides, um, but it's, it's possibly that we wouldn't, well, we might have heard of individual, um, Paul might have gone on his own because Paul was kind of made up. But, with, for John Hammond, he did it over over fifty years, sixty. Yeah, years. absolutely. Yeah, he, he had a, a sort of quiet time. Uh, he, he was he served in the war, and then when he came out of the war, it, bebop was um, you know and sort of that kind of uh, modern jazz in a way uh, was coming to the fore. And he wasn't very impressed with that. And for quite a bit of the sort of 40s and 50s, he was involved with, um, you know, the, the people he'd been in, involved with earlier, the, the swing bands and stuff. And he got re-inspired, interestingly enough, in, uh, you know, the beginning of the 1960s with the, the new music. And Aretha Franklin was uh, one of the um, very first stars. Um, I mean, she had her first um, album on Columbia in 1961. I mean, it, she's interesting. I mean, she came from a very much um, a church uh, background and actually has at least one LP and probably several singles of uh, gospel music uh, before she was discovered by um, uh, John Hammond and uh, brought into the studio to uh, really become one of the greatest soul singers of, um, of all time. But what, what's interesting as well is he, he was, um, he was very faithful to the sort of roots of the music. I mean, there's a great story of um, <clears throat> when he was with in um, Colombia. He'd been to the UK and he came back. This is 1962. He came back from uh, some trip to the UK <clears throat> and he discovered that his, well, his colleague, his boss or his boss's boss's boss, uh, a guy called David uh, Kaprilik, who was head of uh, A&R at Colombia. Uh, he discovered, uh, this is the early 60s, he discovered gospel music. But what he'd done, he turned it into sort of gospel pop. He'd really sort of um, trivialised it. And when Hammond came back, he was quite disgusted at this. And apparently he had a bit of a row, a bit of a contretemps with um, old David and told him in no uncertain terms, you know, he's his boss or his boss's boss, that he, he was uh, seriously unimpressed with this. And... Um, Capric told him he, that uh, he, Hammond, Hammond should resign. <laughs> and uh, Hammond said, you, I have no way I'm resigning. You can sack me if you like. Uh, there's no way I'm going to resign. And then Capric uh, thought he'd outmaneuver Hammond. And he went to the press and announced that um, Hammond had resigned. Now, fortunately, Hammond got uh, wind of this before it was published. And Hammond went to the press and said, you publish that and I'll sue. Of course, they couldn't publish it. It wasn't, it wasn't true. So he had a really big um, falling out uh, over the, uh, over the um, trivialization, if you like, of, um, of gospel music. You know, he wanted to stay uh, true to the faith, as it were. 
keep keep it pure. I think yeah. it's like that with 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 blues music. Mm. And certainly mm. like that with with um with the the what we 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 now know to be um uh, the pure jazz music of the time, Billy Holiday and on the like and without him doing that everything would have sounded like cheapy cheapy cheap cheap you know for absolutely years of, of that's the only song I've yeah, <laughs> <I've been talking. laughs> so just, just people who say let's make it sound like that and you think oh my gosh missing the point music like like culture like us individual should be um, uh, encased in its own individuality. It's what we are. That, that, I'll tell you what, that's, that's tickled me. <laughs> cheapy, cheapy, cheap, cheap. And it's the only song I know. <laughs> oh, me, it's coming up even in the chat. It's the worst thing I could have dropped in tonight in conversation, you know what I mean? I did not want to. <laughs> it's all about Billy Holiday and, and you know, John Hammond and Dylan and. Um, but it, it is the uh, it is the singer uh, associated uh, the lady sings the blues. Who's that? Billy Holiday. Billy. Oh, is that Billy Holiday? Yeah. yeah. Well, do you, do you know you, you mentioned uh, gospel singers there. Mm -hmm. Was mm -hmm. uh, was Elvis by any chance influenced by gospel? Oh, very much so. I mean, he was a uh, big church goer, um, and he he was very influenced by. Uh, gospel. In fact, uh, he he did fail. I forget the name of the band now, but there was a very a very big gospel band um, in Memphis at the time, <clears throat> and Elvis failed uh, an audition uh, for them. This was the audition would have been just before he cut his first um, Sun single, and the, the reason he failed was the uh, the band, the gospel band, felt he couldn't harmonize. He was okay as a lead singer, but he couldn't harmonize. Um, oh. And what happened was that uh, shortly after that, uh, his first single uh, took off uh, locally. It was very, very uh, big. And tragically, um, one of the uh, the group was killed in a, I think it was a plane crash, a plane crash or a car crash, I think a plane crash. And they approached Elvis uh, and said, are you still interested in joining us? Um, but then now, it, you know, his rock and roll career is really starting to take off and he didn't. So, you know, on a parallel universe somewhere, you've got Elvis as a gospel star. But, I mean, there's a lot of his um, his music is gospel-based. In the 60s, when, uh, you know, the colonel decided that um, the only way you'd see Elvis is to go to the movies, and the only way you'd hear Elvis is uh, songs which are taken, by and large, from the movies. And one of the only pieces of original work uh, between sort of 62 and 69 was a gospel album. Um, all the rest of the albums were either rehashes of early recordings um, or straight from the uh, from the movies. So I think gospel, uh, well, I know gospel was a very big part of um, Elvis's influence. I mean, it's interesting to note of his five Sun singles, uh, so 10 sides, four of them were Billboard Top 40 hits on the country chart. He didn't have any on the pop chart, but he had four hits, uh, quite big hits. Um, on the country charts so you know Elvis was very much uh, down the sort of gospel um, uh, for, uh, gospel um, and he always was country, he? The, the, <clears throat> the snippets of his later movies um, with his on tour and stuff mm. and he's in the dressing room like an hour or so before they go on and the singing gospel songs yeah um, in the early days, it would have been the Jordanaires and the like, but um, in later days, still doing it because it was, um, I think it was empowering for him. To, oh, absolutely. To it's like, can, I, uh, can I mention a few, uh, you know, the, the people are listening, you know, the lads are listening and girls. And uh, can I just read out a few comments, by the way, please, lads? Um, Gary Rigby says, uh, me too, but well, he's talking to the, the bars. Rosetta is one of my faves. Rosetta, are you better? Are you well? Yeah, I think that good lyrics. Yeah, I do know that, actually. 
But anyway, Charlie Woods, I think he comes out with a very poignant one here. Sad news about Steve Early. Makes me think who the heroes are going to be in the future. So many of ours have gone. And I like the way he, he said ours, because this is our generation, isn't it? Absolutely. And one of the, uh, you know, the first ones to go, uh, besides Freddie Mercury, I, I, I'm going back there, you know, to... You know 30, what? 30, 30 years ago. Yeah, I, I, agree with, I agree with you, Frank, and I agree with Charlie. Um, and and at the risk of, of sounding um, ages that off the, the scope, I don't think we're making heroes anymore. We're making no. little squeaky bands who make money for corporates, but we're not we're not giving. This is where John Hammond comes in handy. We're not giving um, pure talent a chance. To, to to go through which we, we had in the 70s and we had in the 80s and then it started to fade um, growing up in a generation we did we had it all now do it all there yeah well soul boy francis that's a james i'd rather go blind a brilliant blues track i've never yeah. heard of that oh yeah it was covered by fleetwood mac i think oh but really? that's the original I, I think so. That, 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 that I think, is the original. It's a brilliant song. I mean, Etta James, absolutely amazing R&B singer. And uh, Gary Rigby, uh, I, I think I, I went to see these on the, uh, was it the Philharmonic? The Isley Brothers, Behind a Painted Smile. Yeah. At, at least, at least, uh, I'm getting to know some of them here from Chirpy Chirpy Cheap Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> to be yeah. Isley Painted <laughs> we'll go back and blip that one. <laughs> oh, you'll never lift that. So. I'm swallowing the lads. I think it was Gary Rigby. He says, I like it. I like Jeffy. I like this time, but I'm just going It's just nuts, isn't it? It's absolute nuts. Right just carry on talking, lads. I'll give up. <laughs> But this, this is the problem, is, is not, not, not the problem per se, but um, <clears throat> music is music. So you, 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 you put it out there and you have very, very honourable, um, hand on heart thinking people like John mm -hmm. Hammond and there's many others who brought us some of the greatest music ever. Peter Grant, if you want to talk rock and roll with, who, who brought Zeppelin to, to the front. And then you have people who are more interested in how much money that song about the little yellow donkey might bring in or this or that and the other. And it's, it becomes, um, and it's the same with art and it's the same with literature and it's the same with, with film. You know, we have this, this constant crossover and, and, and who are we to govern what we tell people is is good to listen to or watch. Can I come in there? Can I come in there? Because when I was a kid, um, my uncles, you, you, you know, they were young as well. Well, not young, you know, they were in the teens, late teens, early 20s. And every Sunday, you know, when you're sitting down after your tea or whatever, they put, um, they put Radio Luxembourg on. And a fellow by the name of Jack Jackson. You never forget that name, Jack Jackson. Can I ask both of you, Derek? Did he actually, did he actually bring in American music to us from, you know, Radio Luxembourg? The, the, you know the uh, the channel. Jack Jackson. Jack Jackson. I you knew one on me, that Frank. Oh, is it? Do you remember him? Uh, or have I got his name wrong? I don't, I don't remember the name, Frank, but I, I do remember. I, I got it wrong. I, I don't know. I might have got it wrong. I'm awfully sorry. I, I, Especially with you, Jerry. I've never heard of him. Radio Luxembourg, I think, was very important because it was bringing us stuff that wasn't on 
normal radio, commercial radio. I used to oh, fall asleep yeah. as a teenager, head under the covers with Radio Luxembourg going. Oh, and absolutely. Even people like Van Morrison that we weren't listening too much or we weren't allowed to, to, to listen too much on, on radio was coming through. I think Radio Luxembourg and the like was, was fantastic. Yeah, well, in the UK at that time, you only had um, the light programme. Um, and what happened was uh, Radio Luxembourg was one of the very, very few uh, stations pumping out pop music. And yeah. um, what happened was that uh, the, the pirate radio stations, Radio Caroline, Radio London, Radio Liverpool, um, all started around. Radio Caroline was the first transmission, 1964. And it took the government and the BBC three years till 1967 to realise that there was a market for non-stop pop music um, every day. And I think the other point that's interesting as well, pick up on again, is that um, one of the differences now, if somebody doesn't have a hit record first time around, it's, it's pretty much cheerio back to your day job. And I can remember Frank Zappa uh, commenting on this in the, the mid 60s, uh, well, the mid late um, 60s saying, uh, you know, with the hippie thing, what happened was, you know, the hippie movement grew out of um, a, a, a great, um, a desire for money to be meaningless, everybody live happily ever after kind of thing. But what happened was uh, the radio, uh, the uh, record companies cottoned onto the fact that the teenage market in the mid 70s, so it's not the summer of love around then, had become big business. So the whole hippie thing was taken over uh, by big business. I mean, Frank Zappa comments and in some of the lyrics in his songs talks about where phony hippies meet. And he said that um, when the record companies were run by old boys in uh, grey suits, it was great because they didn't understand the music, uh, but they, they'd give it a go. And then the record executives became young, hip people who thought they knew at least as much, if not more, about what should be going out. Um, and that was really when it started in terms of um, uh, artists not having, um, you know, a long time to get their act together. And I think John Hammond is a great example um, of giving artists a try, you know, with, uh, with Bob Dylan. What happened was uh, uh, Bob Dylan uh, went in to uh, play harmonica um, on a Caroline Hester album. It wasn't the first album, but it was a, about the third album. Uh, but it was the first for uh, Columbia Records. And uh, John Hammond produced it. Uh, Dylan played harmonica on three tracks. And uh, John Hammond seriously impressed with Bob Dylan and uh, signed him. And shortly afterwards, it, it didn't take that long in those days to record an album. <clears throat> uh, Bob Dylan's album was released and the sales were very, very poor. And yeah. uh, Bob Dylan became known as Hammond's Folly. Yeah. Uh, but John Hammond persevered with him. And you know, there aren't many people who've achieved more fame at so more levels than uh, Bob Dylan. So again, you know, John Hammond is up there with the good guys. I, I, I love that story because again, it's like giving, giving space to, to, to the unknown, you know, yeah. and just, just taking that risk. And we need that in literature, we need it in, all across the whole board. And I, I, as a kid, I loved that album. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dylan's first album, which is kind of, Hard to listen to if you're going backwards now to, and to play it because technology and everything has moved on so much. But um, I love the rawness and the fact that he wasn't singing a song like Mel Torme or someone. He was, he, what you're buying was was him, which is what I think music and art and literature and everything should be about. It's an individual thing. Um, but what, what I've, I, I read, I was reminded today that John Hammond has got a son who's now 80, 81, John Hammond Jr. And as a young musician, he came across the band before they were called the band. Mm. He suggested to Dylan, these are the great bunch of lads that you should, mm. should record with. Mm. Can, I, uh, can I ask, uh, can I... You know, bring in a few comments here, lads, please. Oh, boss. Been listening intently. Uh, Charlie Watts, 
I remember Jack Jackson, he was ahead of his time, so he did exist. I go for that. <laughs> well, that's good. I can't remember her name, but I remember the station. Thanks, Charlie. And uh, Gary says, uh, Gary Rigby, that is, Kenny Everett got his start on Radio Luxembourg. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And he yeah. carries on by saying, uh, Zappa was very intelligent and made loads and loads of great records. Absolutely. It was very and, uh, Lynn Ellis. Yeah, there's one for you. Just let me go through these last two with Lynn here. Frank Anthony, Derek, what is your favourite song of all time? And uh, Vaz of Flowers. I like Dylan. I like Zappa. Uh, but I love Captain Beefheart more than either Bob Dylan or Frank Zappa, to be brutally frank. That's what he says. And uh, Charlie says, Lynn Ellis, Charlie was pretty big country in the charts, not too well known in this country. And uh, Jack was a band leader, trumpet player. I don't know who they're talking about there. But uh, so listen, lads, have you got it? It's just right out the blue. I'm not, I, I won't be able to answer it, but what's your favourite song ever? Very difficult. Um, it's, it, you can't come out, can you, really? I mean, I mean some, some, you know, play over and over again. Things like um, uh, Pink Floyd, Wish You Were Here. Um, and, uh, and it's some Dylan as well as a track he, he, he does called Grain of Sand, which is one of my all-time favourite uh, Dylan tracks. Um, so many, really. I think I like her own. Zappa's outside now. I think it's yeah. uh, brilliant. I think uh, like a Rolling Stone was a, a cracker by um, yeah. by Dylan. You know, I yeah. thought that was brilliant. Oh, but, you know, you, you look at like the likes of the Beatles, for example, and all you need is love. Yeah. You know, you, you can't give peace a chance. Incredible. Incredible. Even Lennon's uh, solo, Imagine. You know, the lyrics in that. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. And it yeah. applies today. That's why the Beatles never ever, um, you know, they'll never go out of fashion, no matter well, what. Their no music is timeless. Yeah, their music is timeless. You know, you, yeah. you listen to it. It, it, it doesn't place itself in the in the no. 60s, mostly. Once you get past sort of Rubber Soul when it was all their own uh, compositions. I mean, they really are, you know, songs like Taxman. Nobody was writing um, no. anything like that. No. Um, they really are timeless. I mean, obviously, some of the Pepper stuff is caught up in the psychedelia, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. You can very firmly place in 77, 78. You think that was ahead of its time, though? You know, uh, Peppers. Poetically, certainly, yeah. Lyrically. Yeah. It was, it was kind of... Uh, I, I, I think it marked a point in time. It's the way, the way certain music can and nail. You know, it's, it's like when when someone says, what, what song marks the 60s? Well, there's probably about five or six that come to mind immediately, but that that is like one of them. That's like goodbye to the sixties and we're we'll moving on. But, um, I know what your their favourite song is because uh, I think I've heard you singing it, uh, Anthony. I've definitely well, heard you singing it, you and your mates, and was cheapy cheapy cheap. <laughs> You've only ever heard me sing that once, Frank, and that's when I, I think you brought the house down. You brought the house down, and you brought the house down in the Anglican Cathedral. <laughs> no, most of, I, I mean, I, I, I take my hat off to the pair of you because it's a hard one to to pick one song. I mean, I can I can pick three songs, um, but I love the whole Beatles catalogue. But one song that stayed with me since uh, I was little 
and the more I read about it, the more I, I, I loved it. Was Gersh, uh, George Gershwin, George mm. and I, Gershwin, called mm. Our Love Is Here To Stay. And maybe, Derek, you, you, you just, there's a story I remember reading about it years ago, which is basically George Gershwin was uh, a, a genius at his music, um, but a well-known hypochondriac. And um, he was forever saying, I've got a headache, I've got to take time out and go away and come back. And in his final month, he did that. He composed a piece of music, but he didn't have a chance to share it with his brother Ira, who wrote the lyrics. Mm. So they, they, they kind of talked about it. What are you working on? I'm working on this. Bam, bam, bam. And then George died suddenly in his 30s, and Ira um, could not have completed the song when George was alive. And the story goes that when they had George's funeral, that Ira sat in the back of the car, either going to or coming from the funeral, and all the lyrics come to mind. And when you listen to the song, it's kind of about a... Um, a, a guy and a girl thing, you know, uh, but the lyrics are very, very profound and it's a brother to brother thing, which which stayed with me. The, the, the fact that George, the last piece of music he wrote and that I had composed the words going to the funeral. And um, it's so many versions of it over the years, pop versions, jazz versions, Ella, been the best one, you know, knocking coal, uh, mm. all of it. And it just took me with the poignancy. And it's like Frank said before about the, the, the sheer power of music is in its emotion and its ability to draw you back to a place. And I'm, I'm being teased to your eye. You know, um, many, many times we, we walk around and you, you walk into a to a shop or, or a restaurant or something and it plays a piece of music and you, it's like, wow. I remember uh, one of my uh, mature students coming to see me, you know, um, he, he brought his, I, I said to him, I've got to have your, uh, your papers and I've got to, I've got to mark them. He said, can I bring them in next week? I said, no. I said, you've got to get it done within 48 hours. I said, but I'm off. Uh, until next week, but I've got to have them in by Thursday. I said, I want to mark them Friday, so I've got my weekend free. So he said, uh, can I come down and see you then? I said, okay. So I gave him my address. And then he, <laughs> I brought him in. And the radio was playing. And uh, I said, you know, I'll give him a cup of tea. And I said, he said, do you know why? Uh, I'm late with it. He said, I have just haven't been concentrating. He said, my girlfriend packed me up. And I went, so I'm sorry about that. And he went to tell me about it. What come on the radio? It was Roy Orbison's, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't get out of that. I'll be <laughs> <out of you. laughs> He said, can you turn that off? <laughs> Well, I thought, so, can I just uh, look? Uh, I, I know we, I know we've got to go. Uh, but I ain't gonna get that back, a stupid thing, right? Like because some of the lads have uh, have said uh, one of these days, these days by Nico, one of these days by Nico yeah. says uh, the vase of flowers that I you know when Vince said about famous, oh the best, you know. I did a gig um, years and years ago in the Hacienda in Manchester, and we were supporting Nico, and all of my guitar gear got nicked. <laughs> oh dear. So, Nico doesn't ring a great bell with me, Lee. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, that's the end of that. Well, she, she was pretty good with the Velvet Underground, <laughs> but she was good on her own as well. Well, uh, Gary Rigby, Echoes by Gene Clark. Soul Boy, he says, White as Shades of Pale always gets uh, voted number one all the time. 
And you know, that's it, isn't it? Really, some of the great, some of the great uh, songs, and these have said them. These have actually said them uh, about, uh, you know, what's their favourite. But it, it is, it's a very odd thing. I think it's, it's just the Beatles with me because it brings back so many memories. The Beatles bring back so many memories for me. They've written so many classics. So it's, it's like if you wanted a song to sum up your life at the end of your life or whatever, um, without being maudlin, there's just so many classic songs that the Beatles wrote. You've got In My Life, Long and Winding Road, stuff like that, which are beautiful. I, I have kind of got two songs that I like the idea of pounding out of the speakers on the day I go through the curtain. One would be Junk by Paul McCartney, which is on his, his first solo album, which I think is one of the most simple but beautiful poignant melodies and tunes. And the other one would be Voodoo Child Slight Return by Jimi Hendrix. Well, wow. wow. Seeing no more in this world and meeting the next one. Can I just say, guys, I've got to go in through the curtain one uh, <laughs> as well. Yeah. It's Warren Zevens, My Rides Here. But it wouldn't actually, I love Warren Zevon. It wouldn't be his version. Frank, uh, Bruce Springsteen does a fabulous live version of it. And it must have been recorded uh, just after Warren, uh, Warren's death. He died from cancer, sadly. Um, because at the beginning, he said, you know, uh, dedicate to my great friend, Warren Zevon. But, I mean, my rides here, I mean, that would be up there in my all-time favourites. But that is definitely my going through the curtain uh, to the great warm finish. It's, strange, yeah. isn't it? it's it's like some music gets so close that you 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 kind of think that that is the special one. And Absolutely. you we love we love we all love music and we all love different kinds of music. And it's like someone puts you on the spot and says, You've got one more tune on this planet and and, and there we go, you know. Would you like to say, am mine going through the curtains, by the way? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't go through it's the curtains. <laughs> it will be happy days for you, wouldn't it? It will be happy days for you. <laughs> but you know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. It would have been, oh, me, oh, bambino, caro. That's what it would have been. But it's got to be one of the greatest pieces of classical music ever. And it's Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings. Mm. I'll have everybody cry. <laughs> <laughs> I've even been crying myself going through. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, yeah. other one, my other one for the curtain oh, would be oh, Wagner oh, so uh, from The that. End of Rheingold, uh, Ascent of Valhalla. Um, I mean, that would be, yeah, that would be a fun one. What would yeah. be nice, it's about 15 minutes long. Uh, if, if I was told I had to, li I could only listen to one more and then that's it, I think it would almost certainly be uh, 10 years after going home, the uh, live Woodstock version, because it's about oh. 10 minutes. Well, <laughs> Alvin, geez, that's Alvin at his best there. Oh, right? That is an <laughs> awesome, awesome rendition. I'll tell you what, can I uh, tell you, you know, before you're going to go, Derek, I'm sorry because Jason's waiting. He's like this, pressing this thing. Yeah, look, it's just gone. Um, I'll tell you what it is. And I, I think it's underrated. Well, not underrated. Not at the time it wasn't underrated. But it hardly ever gets mentioned. And that's Lola by the Kinks. Yeah. Kinks. I think it's brilliant, that. It's a great song. Absolutely. And it's based on fact as well, isn't That's it? That's right. That's right. You're 71, that wasn't it? Yeah. They had to yeah, be recorded yeah. as well. Everybody's being made up tonight with you and the other fella. And, he, and uh, Jason says, uh, he said, well, <laughs> Jason, producer. Jason's One of my favourites is uh, Fleetwood Mac and Peter Green. Need your love so oh, bad. Oh, yeah. I love that tune. Yeah. I yeah love that that's tune. unbelievable. Jason is having a go. 
It's really good. That's really, I tell you what, you've, you've caught my song there. Absolutely brilliant. Derek, yeah. I, I've got to go. Yeah, look, uh, our, our sponsor says, how oh, about the search is doing <laughs> another thank you to go. <laughs> Well, I'll let be listening to that before I go to bed, I think. <laughs> no, 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 that cracked me up. That, that cracked me up. You know, mm. you're coming out with all the classics and it comes out with that, it comes out with it. I know you. We're, we're talking to some of the greatest music in the world and I I, I only said it to say there's, there's that and there's this, you know. Well, uh, you know, the Gap Payton service is there. Um, it's Andy Andy Gamble, and he fronts a band called Searching, and yeah. they're absolutely brilliant because they're a the tribute to the Searchers. That's why he's put that up. Good. That's a, and we've been talking a lot anyway, and I I, I hope Andy uh, he's um, he's coming under to doing this big thing, you know, with loads of bands. Uh, yeah, there it is. And I'd love you to come on at the time, Derek. You know, when we're talking to Andy, and yeah, obviously you nice. as well there, uh, Anthony. What, what do you think, you know? Yeah, I don't know good. when he's coming on to talk about it because he's getting the bands uh, uh, sorted. Would you, would you come on with that? You know, yeah, the absolutely, show? love to. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely. And, and he says here, yeah, my funeral songs at my cremation, Johnny Cash, Bear's <laughs> Ring of Fire, then Doreen, things can only get better. <laughs> As we get onto this subject, having a clue, Andy. <laughs> having a clue. We're happy, can guys? Hmm. Absolutely. Oh, listen, Honest to God, I, I, it's been great. Jenny, obviously, you'll be here very soon, won't you? You know, in the next week or two. Absolutely. So, I mean, I'm, I'm awfully sorry that I, I never had a clue about this Peter Ammons. I never had a clue about him. Uh, so, what will you be talking about the, the next time? Could you be talking about songs, certain songs from different eras? Uh, that made an impact, say like, uh, how can I put this, an impact on, you know, on people's lives, for example. You know, we had, didn't we, uh, uh, Scott McKenzie, yeah. if you're going to San Francisco, you know, that was the hippie movement. Yeah. You had the likes of uh, Give Peace a Chance, if you know what I mean. You know, yeah. right up to the present, uh, even that Johnny Rotten, you know, God save the Queen, because he was having to go with the establishment. But I'm not saying talk about them, uh, mm. if you know what I mean. But could you, like, gather together some songs that you think, you, not me or uh, Anthony, made an impact on, uh, you know, the way, the way we were? Yeah, absolutely. But, That'd be quite fun. Because you know the the, the likes of uh, the, the likes of Gary, uh, he said Gary Rigby, no Soul Boy, was it Gary Rigby or Soul Boy Frank? And he, I think it was Gary Rigby when he said uh, about um, uh, what made an impact was White as Shades of Pale, yeah. and that word I, I I resonate with that when it you know just see it and it comes back. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what else resonates with me as well. Was uh, Billy Joe Spears, uh, Blankets on the Ground. I don't know why, but that resonates with me. You know, a blanket, it is a Blankets on the brown, uh, Ground, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I, th and I think Joe. there's certain styles of music that changes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, when Motown came in, you had the likes of Marvin Gaye and headed mm -hmm. through the grapevine and stuff like that. That changed um, a course of music in that soul and and which 
shortly after became disco, became um, conventional. Just stuff like that. Rock and roll was the same. Mm. But don't you think Johnny Cash, whether you know you, whether you love the jazz, whether you love pop, whether you love classical, whether you loved anything, and Johnny Cash, you know, everybody loved him. Mm. No matter what kind of uh, music you liked. Yeah. Uh, am I right by saying that, by the way? Because everybody seemed to love Johnny Cash. Oh, I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah he's a bit of a one-off Johnny Cash. That's what I mean. Yeah, he was a one-off, wasn't he? Goes so back to what Eric was saying before about um, people, John Howland, people allowed to be what they are. You know, so you got Johnny Cash, and then you like it or, or not, and he, he, he hit almighty Elvis the same. Just the sound of that voice was just something mm -hmm. else. No. And they both started Sun Studios. Yeah. Around the same time. And Roy Orbison did, yeah, yeah. And Roy Orbison. The big yeah. old loved him. Yeah. I, 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 I would have loved to have seen the big old in concert. Yeah, absolutely. I would have loved to have seen him. Yeah, I think the Beatles supported him on his uh, British tour. He yeah. did. I, I yeah. heard a great story which said that um, he was a big name. So the Beatles, I think, the second on the bill or whatever. Mm. But as the tour progressed, the Beatles were selling out mm. um, venues and their records were going to the top of the charts. Mm. So Roy Orbison called a meeting with them and said, listen, um, you guys should be top of the, the bill and I'll drop my name below you. And um, I'd have to find out the information about that, or perhaps it, it, it's out there, you know. And I thought, wow, what, what, a, what a, a wonderful thing. But I know they've remained friends with him for his yeah. entire life, George Harrison particularly. Yeah. Cause yeah. A similar thing happened with the uh, Helen Shapiro tour, which is the first time the Beatles toured the UK. Because yeah. it, it was sort of just after Love Me Do, and I think uh, Please Please Me was just coming out. And it was... Uh, you know, very successful. And I think they started off opening the show and then uh, halfway through the tour, uh, you know, they'd end the first uh, first half. So, you know, they were progressing up the uh, up the ladder on their first tour. I, I, I'm going to keep you on for the next hour, if you don't mind. Is that all right, Terry? Yes, yeah, okay. You don't mind? No, fine. Okay. You're brilliant. Okay. We love you, so Thank you and Andy. And, you know, I just feel sorry for uh, Gary Rigby because he says, got to be all sad ones at mine in case nobody cries. <laughs> Don't <laughs> <want to> be <laughs> What can you say? I've got to do this break. I'll see you after the break, boys. See you later. Bye. Um, getting back to music here. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark Simon says, Ray Davis admitted in his concert at the Philharmonic, that Waterloo sunset was a, yeah, it was. Uh, do you know that, Derek? Yeah, I've heard the, that. The Liverpool sunset. Yeah. But they forced them to change. Do you know why they forced them? I always remember this. It, I, I remember Ray Davis being interviewed, you know, um, it was only a few years ago. And he said, there's too much at the time. You know, with the Beatles and the, you know, the Mersey sound, the Mersey beat era. He said, there's too much going on about Liverpool. Why don't you change it too? And that's where they said about Waterloo. Yeah, I mean, the that's whole music it. scene was really centred on Liverpool, wasn't it, in uh, yeah. 63? I mean, yeah. it's, it's interesting. It, if you look at the British invasion in 64, when British bands were dominating the American market for a couple of years, the most of the two thirds, probably, if not more, of the acts who had uh, you know top forty Billboard hits were actually Liverpool acts. They were very much the the, the first wave of the bands to uh, become successful uh, in America. But what's interesting as well, Ray Davis, um, they famously never, uh, well, not at that time, had much success in in America. And one of the stories uh, suggests that uh, what happened was they were on tour. In America, and in America, the music business is very, very unionized. You know, if you've got your own British roadies, they do not touch anything. 
you hire American roadies and they do absolutely everything. And apparently, uh, Ray, uh, Ray Davis got into a bit of a contretemps with one of the, the union guys and thumped him. And the, the union then promptly blacked, uh, blacklisted um, uh, the kinks. So then, you know, they couldn't, oh. uh, couldn't go back. And I sometimes wonder if that's why they became such a quintessentially English band, you know, uh, as Village Green Preservation Society. You know, of all of, not necessarily all, of, but they are one of the most, if not the most, sort of quintessentially English um, band. Wow. Fantastic. I never heard that. Yeah, brilliant. Good on, Ray. <laughs> It just shows you, doesn't it? You know, um, the way the way things pan out, mm. you know, from music to history. And this is what it's all about, because no matter how you look at music, you know, my favourite pieces of music, I'm not talking about the, the you know, the pop show. I'm talking about uh, classical music and opera. I love that. I was brought up with that, mm. uh, you know, in the house. Uh, because my mother was a great pianist and my uncles were fantastic pianists too. And they played all this like Italian music, on Puccini and Verdi and these people. And uh, one of the greatest pieces my uncle Frankie used to play was the 1812 Overture. Mm. So it's, it's like that, that just resonates with me. Yeah. It really does. And Adagio for strings as well. That's how I know about uh, Barbara's uh, Azazio. Absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant. But when you look at, you know, different types of music, mm -hmm. uh, from jazz, as you said, mm -hmm. and I remember talking to you, you know, well, at the uh, a, a, a weeks and weeks ago now, about Humphrey Lillerton. Mm -hmm. And he used to go down the cabin because it was a jazz club. Oh, club. absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Kenny Ball, can you talk yeah. about that a little? Yeah, well, he, when uh, Ray Sittner opened the cavern, he, he took the name from a Parisian uh, nightclub that was, uh, you know, whatever the cavern is, Le Cavern in uh, in Paris. But he, he was um, very keen for it to be, well, he, he insisted that it was a jazz club. I mean, he tolerated Skiffle, <clears throat> Be <clears throat> because skiffle came out of um, trad jazz, what would happen is um, uh, jazz bands would have a, an interval group. So when the guys went to um, to the bar at lunch at, at the uh, the interval outside for a smoke or whatever, uh, three or four of four of them would often change instruments, or other people would join them, um, and they'd play skiffle for uh, twenty minutes. I mean, famously, uh, Lonnie Donegan was part of Chris Barber's. Um, band. So when they broke out, Chris Barber changed to um, upright bass, I think. Uh, Bell Bryden joined them on uh, Washboard, and uh, uh, Lonnie Donegan exchanged his uh, banjo he played in the jazz band to uh, to a guitar, and then they would play as a, a skiffle group. And in fact, when uh, New, I think it's New Orleans Joys, um, the, the album that um, those. Uh, Lonnie Donegan uh, skiffle songs uh, come from, you know, Rock, Rock Island Line. Um, they're actually credited on the album to the Lonnie Donegan skiffle group, uh, as opposed to, you know, Chris Barber's um, jazz band. And famously, uh, when the Beatles, well, not the Beatles, when the Quarrymen uh, played there for the first time, um, you know, they, they, they were called Quarrymen skiffle group. Um, and they went, and apparently John Lennon uh, said, started playing uh, a couple of um, uh, Elvis songs and nobody's ever seen it but the urban myth is that uh, Sittner, Ray Sittner sent a note to uh, to John Lennon on stage while they were playing to say cut out the bloody rock uh, and you know probably he really wasn't uh, wasn't into it but they did uh, they did realize by about 59 I think it was the cavern had its first uh, beat night I think Rory Storm and the Hurricanes with Ringo uh, headlined that particular uh, event. Because famously, before that, um, while R uh, Rory Storm, he was playing uh, at, you know, a jazz night. And he started playing rock and roll and got all kinds of 
um, problems. But even Ray Sittner recognised that, um, you know, the, the writing was um, on the wall uh, for that. How big was uh, Rory Stall? The bigger than the beach, the bigger than the quarry men. They they were one of the most popular bands. I think you know, I, I think a lot depends on um, how you look back on these things. Um, but you know, if you read a lot of contemporaneous um, um, stuff, you know, Rory Storm was very much uh, seen as more popular uh, than the Quarry Men in the uh, the very early days. As were bands like the, the Big Three. Um, famously, Johnny Hutchinson, uh, the drummer. Uh, on his website, he suggests, um, and it, it corroborated elsewhere, that um, Brian Epstein uh, offered him the job of replacing uh, Pete Best, but he turned it down because he didn't think that the Beatles was as good as his band, the Big Three, because they wow. were uh, Casanova, uh, oh, Cass and the Casanovas uh, originally, and then uh, Brian Casser uh, decided in late 59, uh, he decided that he'd try his luck in London <clears throat> because, you know, these guys have been beaving away since sort of 55, 56, 57, really very, very successful in Liverpool and the sort of northwest, North Wales kind of um, area, but not much wider than that. So he decided in late 59, Brian Casser, that he'd go off to, uh, to London, uh, try his hand there. And he did. He was the uh, manager of a strip club. The Blue Gardenia, I think it was. Well, it was in uh, in Soho, and the Beatles famously, um, Sam Leach organised a, uh, a gig for them in I can't remember now, uh, Ilford or, or somewhere like that, and famously forty people uh, turned up uh, to that, and they went off to um, uh, the Blue Gardenia afterwards, and apparently uh, gave uh, a, you know impromptu um, performance because they were all all mates and that's one of the thoughts that why Sam Leach isn't the Beatles uh, manager because he was promoting them long before Brian Epstein came on the on the scene you know his big beat uh, shows uh, New Brighton I think the Tower Ballroom um, they, they were attracting like a couple of thousand uh, people and it, it happened when they went down to um, whatever it was uh, Watford kind of area uh, for that battle of the bands with um, a London band, Peter J and the Jaywalkers, I think it was. Um, that was only a couple of days before Brian Epstein um, got involved. So, you know, if that gig had gone really, really, really well, you know, there, there, there is a parallel universe where maybe Sam Leach is the manager. And then that's something to really ponder on. Would the Beatles have been where they are now, as it were, or where they were by 1969, or even by 1967, um, if it hadn't been for, for Brian Epstein at the at the helm. It's one of these things that you never really know. Interesting uh, thing as well, that sort of three degrees of separation with Eric Clapton, um, Brian Casser formed a band called uh, The Engineers, uh, Casey, um, Casey, somebody Casey and The Engineers, famous uh, railway guy. Uh, striker, I think, was to do with, and Eric Clapton. He'd been with a band called the uh, the Roosters, and um, he he joined um, uh, Casey Jones, uh, you know, the Engineers, uh, for about six or seven gigs. Um, but you know, they were a bit on the poppy side there. And then he got an offer of um, uh, replacing Top Topham in the Yardbirds. So that's when he went, and you know, at the beginning of his rise to fame, really. So you know, you've got. Links all over the place, you know, Brian Casser, uh, because his Cass and the Casanovas, of course, became the big three. Uh, the Casanovas decided to stay together, change their name to the big three, and were one of the best live bands I uh, ever saw at the time. Well, I, uh, it's, it's funny you're saying that, not the big three, like, uh, we had a, a school uh, concert, you know, just a school thing, and it was the band that came along. And it was really the first time that I'd ever listened to a live band, really. And you would understand, because it was a little stage uh, in our thing, you know. And it was the uh, the Denisons. Oh, right. And Walking the Dog they had a hit with. Sorry? They had a hit with Walking the Dog, a small hit. Yeah. And do you know what they sang? And it, it still resonates with me today. Is some of the guy? Oh, some absolutely! Guy, you know? Yeah, 
taking my love away from. And they were doing like the cavern stomp and everything. Yeah. They were brilliant. And yeah. that excited me. That really excited me, you know, yeah. because I've never seen anything like it in my life. The only thing that I'd ever heard was uh, the piano getting played and uh, records being there uh, on the same table. That's the only music I ever mm -hmm. heard. And a few buskers, you know, going yeah. around. But that, that, you know, so the things do, um, you know, grab you, grab your attention. Emotions. I think it was the, I think it was the drummer from the Denisons who went on to find fame as um, Sugden um, in Emmerdale. Go yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, he, he was certainly in one of those bands at that time of the yeah, Ilk of yeah. the Denisons. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it, it was the Denisons. Denisons. Yeah. Could so, might you know. well have been. I think one of our yeah. lads uh, would know. Um, you know, I'm sorry about this. I've got a anyway and yeah. uh our lovely lynn says brilliant show tonight catch you next week thank you lynn alice isn't that lovely isn't that lovely thanks lynn. thank you lynn and uh the beatles smoking weeds in buckingham palace toilets game notoriety but queen victoria has already took opium and cocaine at Buckingham, I don't know about the cocaine, but yeah, she had opium. What do you think of that? Uh, you know, the Beatles smoke, you know, did they admit that, that they smoked uh, a little bit of weed, uh, etc.? It, yeah, they, they've uh, they, they've gone on record as saying that they uh, had a smoke uh, while they picked up the OBEs. What do you think inspired? Hang on. What do you think inspired them about Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? Well, Paul McCartney, I think Paul McCartney has recently said that, uh, yes, it was all about um, LSD. Uh, the official story is that um, John Lennon's son, Sean, um, his girlfriend, uh, 11 years old or whatever, uh, painted this picture and had called it Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Uh, I can't remember Lucy's surname, but th that's the sort of official story and the one that's mostly um, put out. And, you know, John Lennon thought, oh, that's a good title. I've, that'll make a good song. Yeah. It's the thing about them. They they didn't sort of, you know, write it down with music, with, with the music and all the rest of it. They, they just created the lyrics um, and then played the music around it. So and I, it, it was fascinating watching that um, rather lengthy documentary about the uh, Get Back uh, recordings at just how much of it they made up as they went along in the uh, in the studio. Um, I thought it was uh, quite fascinating. And now listening to some of the lyrics, um, you, you can sort of hear that it would probably have been a throwaway line. Uh, while they were recording, it was never necessarily intended to stay in, but it just suited the song so well that um, you know it uh, it stayed in the uh, final cut. I think I think that was the beauty of the fall of them. Yeah, all um, firing from different directions, and yeah. and John obviously was was uh, enamoured with the likes of Edward Lear and people mm. like that. Then later Spike Milligan. And the goons and that word playing, that rhyming, mm. um, nonsensical that we would call them. It's only when you look back in context that it looks like uh, profound. Mm. But I, I, I think, uh, and Ringo was famous for for so many one-liners, wasn't he? A hard that, day's night. That's been a hard day's night. Yeah. 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 And Lennon's two books, of course. I mean, they they are very sort of Milligan-esque. You know, Spaniard in the works, and yeah. uh, the other one name escapes me for the moment. Um, you know, you look at those, and they're very childlike drawings and uh, goon esque um, poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the kind of um, um, slightly angle mm. um, poetry, you know, it's not mm. rhyme and moon and June yeah. and stuff. But it's, I, 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 
I think the Beatles are a fabulous example of the whole being far, far greater uh, yes. than the sum of the parts. Uh, totally. um, you know, they, they all needed each other in, in different ways and they, yeah. they complemented each other. Uh, yeah. You know, there's lots of conversations about Ringo and um, other drummers and things, but he was an integral part of that. You know, you watch the um, interviews when they were in Australia and well, America, all over the place. And George Harrison, you know, he, he's often at the centre of um, some of the banter with the, uh, the journalists. Yeah, you know they, they just That's all work right. really well together. Yeah, I I I I think you're exactly right. I think it was it was just one of those you couldn't plan it, no. you know. And people have tried to plan it since then on that mould of a, a four piece band that gives them guitars and mm. see what happens. Doesn't. I, th I think the Beatles were very much a band of um, two halves. You know, you've got the mop tops, rascals. Um, up until Sergeant Pepper, well, no, up until somewhere between uh, Rubber Soul and uh, yeah. Revolver, and then uh, was, it, 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 it changed. You know, the, John and Paul fell out. Uh, Yoko came on the scene, and the second half of the the Beatles story for sort of Pepper onwards is they're just two completely different um, bands. It's not it's not not intended to be a sort of comparison or or you know one's better than the other or whatever. Just just an observation how you know if you look at the Beatles in the you know from, the, from Love Me Do to uh Pepper and then you look yeah. at the Beatles from Pepper through to the end. They're just completely yeah. different stories, a completely different dynamic. I think I, mean, I think technology changed ourselves. a lot. Yeah I, I think we put ourselves at it's that age and, and we we grow, yeah. we grow out of interest to in one thing and it's to another, and we, the joy is in discovery. So you you move with what, what moves you. Mm. I think it got to the point where um, it wasn't enough for any of them to be mm. in a room with with four the four, the four brothers. You know, yeah. they, have to I, I don't, they were ever going to carry on like the Rolling Stones or the Who um, carried on. I think the Beatles um, probably parted at about the right time. I think uh, they they been at the forefront of every new development in pop music uh, from sort of fifty nine. Yeah. And onwards, you know, as they morphed out of being the the Quarry Men into the Silver yeah. Beatles and the Beatles. They moved it so far down the line mm. that even as solo artists, it was hard to compete with their past. Mm. You know, we've we've read about them for fifty years, you know, longer than fifty years, fifty three years, and Paul McCartney, ex Beatle, John Lennon, ex Beatle. You know, mm. they, they all, we were all they were all individual people. And uh, as you said, the, the combination of the four people in the one room, you know, is, was fantastic. But it, it casts a very long shadow. Yeah. And it still has, you know, certainly Liverpool music scenes and um, there's some wonderful bands, but never, they're never going to reach, you can't reach that. No, it's no. like uh, everything else, isn't it? You know, the way you look, you, you, there's so much said about, you know, the Beatles. Yeah. I don't think anything else can be mentioned about them because everything has something to do with the Beatles. It's just been mentioned time and time again. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't get me wrong, I, you know, I love the Beatles. They're the greatest bands on the planet. They yeah. set the they set the precedent for everything. Hmm. But when you look at other bands as well, you know, I mentioned the Kinks there before, but when you look at uh, some of the Mersey Beat uh, bands, the, the, you know, Rory Storm, Rory Storm, unbelievable. Then you go to like the Searches, the Searches with the well, Undertakers. I mean, they, Rory, Rory Storm was kind of just before the, the Beatles and then, um, 
I'm not saying for everyone, but a lot of people my age doubt Rory Storm because Ringo was the drummer for a while. But you, you have the likes of Billy Kinsley in the Mersey Beats, who is a phenomenal vocalist, just mm. absolutely amazing. And I would put him up there as being one of the greatest vocalists ever to come from the city. And the chants we talked about before and, and Joe Ankara, who, who was, was leader of the chants, uh, just amazing people, just amazing talents. And it's almost as if, well, we, we know how newspapers work and how history works and they will go for the big name and then everything else will go on the second, the third, the fourth page or, or not at all won't get mentioned. So we, we're, we're always going to face that. But um, it's nice when you, you kind of grow up and you see the likes of um, Joe Ankara, who's a, a wonderful guy in the arms of Paul McCartney, who <clears throat> remembers very well those days in the cavern of um, the Beatles backing them. Now, the great yeah. irony of all of that. And, mm. It's well, I like uh, I like the zoo songs, and there's uh, you know uh, the vase of flowers mentioned the Lars. Now the Lars, uh, my uh, daughter's first cousin was uh, John Power. He yeah. was uh, in the band, you know, and it, it's 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 amazing. It's just amazing. I, I love the Christians in, in, throughout the, the, the 80s and, and still now. The Christians were fantastic. Um, and it is, you've, you've got all of this, which we, talk, we talked about briefly before about um, how did Liverpool get on to certain music. And a lot of it is historic because of the boats, mm -hmm. uh, the ship, ship lines, because we would get records coming to to Liverpool that the the rest of the country wouldn't necessarily get rock and roll album, Buddy Holly and, and Elvis and stuff like that. Early blues albums and stuff like that would come across mm. with sailors on the boats. So the the bands in the clubs would play those those mm. tracks. And it kind of kicked off. Mersey Beat kind of grew from that mm. kind of um, cosmopolitan multicultural yeah. thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've got bands like Derry and the Seniors who yeah. uh, never really found uh, commercial success. I mean, Freddie Starr uh, joined them and they had uh, dual vocals for, uh, for a while. But, I mean, they were a highly rated, um, arguably the most popular uh, Liverpool band, certainly up there in the, um, you know, the uh, most loved, as it were, in the sort of late 50s, early um, 60s. Yeah. Absolutely. And then you have the likes of um, Alan Williams, of course, who, yeah. who saw this happening and tried to, to bring a scene or it together. And, and, and he did, in many ways he did. He accomplished that. And then the link between Hamburg, which again is another mm -hmm. port town, um, very, very um, driven by music, the youth. Mm -hmm. you, know, so you have that knock-on effect. And of course, you've got Lord Woodbine and the uh, the uh, steel drums uh, yeah. bands uh, at that time as well. Because famously, I think he managed Lord Woodbine. He managed um, a strip club in Liverpool. I forget what it was called. And the Beatles famously uh, actually played there for uh, certainly a week. I'm not sure how long they did, but it, they were certainly there for um, for a week. And yeah. I, that was, I mean, Lord Woodbine was, was very much tied in with Alan, Alan Williams, wasn't he? Because I think he yeah. ran the Jacaranda yeah. um, for a while. Yes. And the Beatles sort of yeah. filled yeah. in because uh, the steel band uh, went off to do something else. And I, I read somewhere that the Beatles got paid in uh, Coca-Cola and beans on toast. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, like, you know, uh, strippers have come out quite a lot, hasn't it? You know, so like, like strip clubs and everything else. Because when I was going to Rome in 77 uh, to watch Liverpool play, my mates were saying to me, you know, Tony, you in old tables. And they were like that, uh, you know, well, what, 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 you know, this ambition of yours, you know, seeing Liverpool. I said, yeah, it's a big ambition to get to just to the final, you know, to see them. 
and for me to go to the Coliseum, and they they, they never had a clue, and they said, is there any strippers on <laughs> the Coliseum? <laughs> I thought it was a club. <laughs> Only strippers. I would have said, oh, no, it's an uh, Asian room. They said, oh, shut you with your Asian room. We want to go to a strip club. Mm. And only kids, you know. But, uh, it's so fun. Listen, boys, uh, can I just say, evening, Frank, Derek, Anthony, and live chat says DW. Hey, DW. Isn't that lovely? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, some of the, look, even the Christians there, you know, they, they were a, a great band. The yeah, Mighty yeah. Bar, you know, by uh, Norman there, absolutely brilliant. And Julian Cope. Mm. Uh, it, it's just, <laughs> look at this. And Norman says, as long as it's not crazy, Neville Strip. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> what I see. I've never heard of these though. Uberville. Oh, Overville. Is that Uberville or Overville? Unless I don't know. I've got a clue. clue there. Having a clue. What that is. But yeah, the Vase of Flowers. Yeah, the first Zootons album is boss. I, I loved them. I loved, uh, you know, the Zootons. I thought they were great. Um, Amy Winehouse uh, did a cover version of. Yeah, that? Valerie. Valerie, Valerie, yeah. that's it. You know, the Zootons, I thought they were fantastic. You know, so we have had some, you know, even now, you know, uh, bands got from going back to the 60s right up to the present day. Yeah. Some mm. brilliant, brilliant bands. I think it's Can like you said before, the, 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 the kind of uh, energy for music has been in the city since forever mm -hmm. certainly since the 50s and then went skiffle and um lonnie donagan i remember as being a big hero not just in liverpool but in, in england because he brought the music of lead belly and everyone to mm -hmm. to us and then it, it's never really stopped although um Every so often the press or the papers would say, oh, it's a new Mersey beat boom. It's never really gone away. It's mm. just been a pulse which has kept on, you know. And we can we can draw a map of, of bands from from before the Beatles until mm. now, you know. Some are brilliant, some are absolutely fantastic, you know. Can I uh, ask all the lads out there and the girls, you know, to uh, subscribe to the channel to get the algorithm out there, please, because there's loads listening in and tuning in. And uh, press the like as well, just to get us out there, you know, because uh, we have a great show, We've got great guests on the likes of Derek. And I don't know who that fella is with a white uh, shirt on, trying to look all smooth and everything else. He always turns up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he turns up every week. <laughs> you know, I'm joking, I'm making a joke. I know. <laughs> but anyway. There you go, Frank. Uh, there's nothing there to dent, really, but yeah, no. <laughs> I'll turn up every week anyway, even if I'm on this side. I don't know, I think, I think you'd sneak on anyway. But anyway, no, I love you, you know that, you know, you, you're my dear friend. And um, Jerry, two weeks. Yep. God blimey, you know, that still sounds enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really enjoyed it. It's been, it's been great, mate. Really enjoyed. I always do. No, no. What I love is the way, you know, we just go off in all kinds of directions, and that's no, just. Yeah, and that's, that's, the way way. that's that's what the, the the ringmaster conjures up. You know, that's what we do. You know, hmm. But the thing is, you see, you know, if you can come out like two, I've got a Gerard Gilligan on. You know, the astronomer next week. Yeah. And uh, I put him on the spot, remember, uh, Anthony? And yeah. I said, what is this? And I showed him this photo, and he just never had a clue what it was. And uh, I'm being honest with you, Derek, that was a UFO I took a picture of. Wow. And he, 
because these don't admit anything. Mm. Don't admit because I showed a photograph of it. I took it. I showed a photograph of this plane, didn't I, uh, Anthony? Yeah. Yeah. And you see a thing coming from the trajectory was going up. Mm. I, I, I'm trying, trying to describe it. The plane is there like that, but in the distance. And this thing was coming up like that. See what I mean? Mm. Well, I took the photo and I took it and you see it coming up. And then the other, the, like the, the side of it, like the other picture I took, the plane was in the distance. And this thing, it had a, a tail. It was that fast. Yes. It, it was a tail, if you know what I mean. You know, leaving yeah. a tail. Yeah. And uh, I said to uh, Gerard, I said, um, what's that? And he went, and he said something, where I said, it's not definitely not a comet or, a, you know, one of these things. I said, because comets fall. And I've shown him a comet before that I took a uh, video off. And you know, you see it falling. Anyway, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't explain, could he, Anthony? He couldn't explain. And he then had, he said, he had two photos. So it wasn't yeah. just one photo. It was like um, sort of during the, the, the close encounter and then following that. I mean, my, my thing looking at it was like, uh, wow, imagine had these things collided. Because um, exactly. what I had been talking to was about, about the rocks the size of um, two up, two down houses falling, yeah. you know, just falling in, into the sky, uh, from the sky to the earth. Well, he said, didn't he? Yeah, he said, you know, it could be the debris, you know, like from what, what's going on around the earth, you know, it's, all it's, this young rockets that fall and, off. I'm not being funny, but a rocket doesn't fall and go like that, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I just, uh, you know, but anyway, he's on next week. He'll be talking about space. But I'll tell you what I'll do with you, Derek. And I know that Jason's listening in and he'll get this. I'll show you those two photographs when you're on in two weeks, I'll start. Brilliant. I'll show it. And, you know, yeah, I'd like right. your idea. Go More on, things in heaven and earth, Horatio. <laughs> I'll have a, 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 a little minute section of uh, which is the greatest songs written about outer space. Oh, yeah. always, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Like five... Five of us. There's got to there's got to be a lot because I know in the sixties with the moon landing and stuff, it became very popular to write about. You know, everyone's going to the moon. Yeah. Telstar, uh, Telstar. Remember yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, so But I want. I really wanted to do in two weeks. You can bring that into the equation. Don't get me wrong. But I'd love you to, uh, you know, come out with some uh, songs that, you know, resonated with the time, mm. even like the, like social issues or whatever. Yeah. You know, that... that That'd that, be that good fun. That. Yeah, that'll be fantastic. That'll be good. I've got to finish now, boys. It's been absolutely... It's been a whiz. It's been smashing. It really has. And it's taken my mind off yesterday. <laughs> I know. But I've got me, uh, I'd just like to tell the people, I've got me uh, football show tomorrow. Yes, football, we'll be discussing everything uh, and uh, our little two-week break. So we've got that tomorrow. And um, we'll be uh, we'll be out tomorrow at eight o'clock. I've just got to thank the wonderful Derek Shelmerdeen and his wonderful insight into all that music. It's up again as rock and roll unraveled. And the, my great friends, the international artist, Anthony, and those two, I was laughing at, I don't know whether you noticed me, I was just sitting back laughing at you. 
because it's a story of having a little conversation sitting in a parlour somewhere in some pub <laughs> talking I, about music. I apologise to... No! No! no thing in my life that inspires me to do anything. No! Music. That was... Oh, someone apologised for that. It was brilliant just listening to you. And all the people listening to you. They were made up with that. That had a media jumping in. You know, so... I've never even heard of these uh, particular uh, songsters. Yep. songsters and that Mr Hammond fellow. Mr Hammond is a genius. There's a lot to him. Yeah. Well, do you, if you say that, that he was a, if you say that he was a genius, uh, what about, what about um, uh, George Martin? Yeah, I, I think they're very, very different characters. I mean, George Martin was first and foremost a producer and very much the fifth Beatle. Um, I think the Beatles would have been a very different commodity with a, a different producer. And I think the thing about Hammond was that it, from a rock point of view, you know, you, you think of Bob Dylan, you think of uh, Bruce Springsteen and soul Aretha Franklin. But there was just so much more to the guy. I mean, you know, from the 20s, he was at the forefront of, uh, of jazz. He actually established so many jazz um, greats. And he was a big um, believer in uh, the civil rights movement as well. I say he was actually a director on the uh, NAACP. So, you know, the guy was just operating. At, and he was a talent scout as well as... In fact, I think he was a talent scout more than he was a, a producer. And he, he was a promoter as well. So that's how he got a lot of these um, artists off the ground. You know, he was the guy that organised the concerts. I mean, Anthony mentioned um, one of them earlier. Uh, very famous, bringing, um, you know, soul, gospel, jazz, uh, all together at Carnegie Hall. Yeah, I think that that generation of music, the, the birth of jazz, and for me, um, more so blues music, established every field mm. of music that we, we've talked about since certainly the Beatles, certainly um, 10 years after, certainly Led Zeppelin, certainly everything else, all came from from that kind of um, yeah. that one album that John Hammond I think pushed out the uh, Robert Johnson yeah. you know um, which came out I think 1961 lit a fire in all of the the guys that we admire you know. who is that He's, fella who is that fella American um, oh, what was his name and there was scandal over him, like paying or something. Oh, and Alan Freed. Alan Freed, oh, the disc jockey, Payola. Payola, that's it, yeah. Yeah, Alan Freed. There, there were a few of them, but the high-profile one was Alan Freed. Uh, but you know what you're talking jockey. to? I'm sorry, to tell you, I've been trying to think about it all night. Uh, you know when you're talking about, you know, what, what I've asked you to talk about, would you bring Alan Freed in somewhere along the line as well? Oh, absolutely. And tell us about him. You're writing it down, aren't you? To us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, awfully going to uh, put you on the spot. And, you know, I mean, he's, like he's, the one who, he's the one who coined the phrase rock and roll. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Which, was a, which was an old expression going back to the oh, blues yeah. camp, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, very com very much comes out of the blues. We can't really talk about on on air, but yeah. <laughs> Rocking but and another, another important we we are all flawed in different ways and some people less flawed than than me and Frank. But yeah. it's like yeah. Yeah, without these these little cogs, without these wheels, you know. We wouldn't be here talking about them. Yeah. Well, Mark Simon says uh, Eric's face in the cavern was very instrumental for live bands back in the 70s and 80s. Elvis Costello, Flock of Seagulls, OMD, The Wire, Frankie Goes, 
and the board. Funny enough, a uh, flock of seagulls, you know, there's a friend of mine, Frank Maudsley, used to be in that. The war, now, the mighty war, you know, one of them, the great friends of mine. Yes. And uh, Frankie, Brian Nash, Nash, yeah, good friends of mine. Teardrop Explode, absolutely brilliant bands, every single one of them. And uh, as uh, DW says, comets don't fall, Frank. And, well, you know, comets don't fall. Those meteorites, comets are massive and on the way off. Well, you know what I mean, DW. I'm glad. So you tune in next week and uh, see uh, the astronomer. But tune in and two, I'm not going to show him them pictures again. So tune in in two weeks, DW, and uh, the pictures I'll be showing my good friend there, uh, Derek Shelmerty. Is a case, isn't it? Is a case. Anyway, lads. Oh, yeah. There's one of my favourite songs. And Mark Simon's the last. There she goes and and encapsulates Liverpool in one song, and the album is a classic, regardless of what Lee Myers says. Yeah, it was a classic, and yeah, he he he, he ripped it to pieces, did he? He ripped it to pieces. Yeah, bars of flowers. Lord John Power of Liverpool was a notorious but little known 17th century pirate. The biggest pirate in Liverpool was uh, Nicholas Blundell. But you know what he was? He was a land pirate. Did you know that there was land pirates? Rather than, you know, the pirates, you know, the yeah. harding lad. You know, like Long John Silver type yeah. fellas that jumped on ships and, you know, grabbed the crew and dropped the gear and dropped the ship. But these land pirates, what he was, what Nicholas Blundell did, he used to go over to Birkenhead, not Birkenhead, you know, New Brighton. And you know where the rocks are, you know, Fair Fort Perch Rock, where that was before that where it was built. In 1827, right before that was built, the, 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 the fort, he used to bring in ships and he used to have a lamp. And the lamp, you know, the, the ships thought that they were there, you know, in safe waters, you know, coming up because they used to have to follow lamps. It was a pitch black, pitch black in back in the, back in the day, you know, the 1600s, 17th century. And, he used to, and they used to flounder. And he used to jump on, you know, whatever it was, the ship, beat the fellas up, chase them, and steal the uh, the gear, the cargo. That was uh, Nicholas Blundell. Right. So he, he, he got that much money. He used to sell it to the council. <laughs> the black market here. He used to smuggle it up. He used to be a little air tunnel leading up from the Mersey up there, yeah. you know. And they used to bring it up. And uh, he made that much money doing it. So he's a land pirate. He never went to sea to uh, mm. do this uh, pirate and stuff. So he's yeah. a land pirate. And he bought a place off Crosby. And uh, he said, oh, I'll have that. So they, they sold him this land part of Crosby. And he named it Blundell Sound. Wow. And his grandson, well, his son, Brian Blundell, he, he had, but he had nothing at all to do with land piracy or anything. He had his own money. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a tobacco merchant. He used to bring the tobacco over from uh, the States into Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, he built the Blue Coat Chambers. Okay. So there's loads of history like that, you know, like Absolutely. not on which is absolutely brilliant. And you know Seal Street? Seal, Mr. Steel, he has one of these magnificent gardens and everyone used to be, you know, the envy. But what he did for Liverpool, you remember when I mentioned about uh, 
the, uh, the, the, the asylum that became a lunatic asylum, the infirmary, well, he built that for the people of Liverpool. Yeah. Then it was knocked down and St. George's Hall uh, was built. So, you know, there's great people, great philanthropists, great everything. And uh, all as I'm saying now, gentlemen, there's a big thank you to Derek, a big thank you to uh, Anthony. Um, I'll see you in two weeks, Terry. I'll yeah. see you next week, Anthony. I'm well, back again yeah. with uh, Derek in two weeks. Is that okay? Yeah. That's true. Thank That's you true. so much, boys. And it's just for me to say a massive thank you to all uh, our friends on there on the chat and they've been absolutely made up they really have and that's why they've been chatting they've been it's been great thank you so much thank you thank you and i'll uh see you next week i've just got to thank jason pennington for uh producing the show for putting those wonderful pictures for me and uh most importantly most importantly the chat because without the chat they wouldn't be a frank carlisle show also uh gap painting services for sponsoring the show uh but this is it thank you so much for uh, joining me in anthony and Derek. thank you boys and girls and i'll see you uh, tomorrow for the uh, football show should be fun it's been a blast man Cheers, guys. Cheers, Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 I'm amazed up your stay, Derek. I'm up your stay. Thank you so much. I oh, really enjoyed it, mate. Thank you. Bye now. Cheers. Bye.